Accents are a little bit worse for wear, uh, largely due to shouting over the last couple of days. Um, so uh, please bear with us. Um, if nothing quite makes sense, don't be afraid to like stick your hand up and clarify or, or use terminology that doesn't make sense. <laughs> except, for the, sorry. except for the first front three rows. Um, now, just to, to help me out, um, this is the third panel I've done at JoeCon now. Uh, that's related to uh, action force, and each time each panel is slightly different. So, can I have a show of hands of anybody who caught the panel in Indianapolis? Okay, uh, last year in Dallas. Okay, and your hands up if this is the first time that you've you've attended this panel. Oh wow, I'm so disappointed in you. <laughs> okay. So each time we've, we've actually changed the panel um, because there's, there's, there's quite a lot of uh, information and, and for people who are here for the first time and not necessarily familiar with what Action Force is, um, in the UK, uh, Action Force was effectively our version of G.I. Joe for the Real American Hero line um, and it was effectively launched like three times, first in 82, then in 83, and then in 87. And it was handled by two different companies, one called Palatoy, and Palatoy was the incumbent uh, British distribution company that actually um, uh, distributed Star Wars toys, for example, uh, but also uh, uh, distributed Action Man. So that's our version of the 12-inch G.I. Joe. And unlike in the United States, Action Man for us sold all the way through the 70s and into the 80s, so it never went away. So to kind of put it into kind of perspective, uh, although the names are different, we, you know, the British culture is very much entrenched in, in kind of like G.I. Joe products, just slightly called different, like slightly different things. Um, now, again, for people who are unfamiliar, Action Force was launched in 82, uh, pretty much to be a three and three quarter inch representation of uh, the, the best selling 12 inch Action Man products. So very different to what it ended up in. But to, to give you an idea of what that looked like. Come to review your action force, Commander. Yes, yes I have. How many will serve the required in this mission? Well, I'm short of one British Marine. Will you be needing transport? <laughs> oh, you be sir, at HQ. Good luck, sir. I expect we'll be seeing you again. Yes, and take charge of the rest of the men till I return, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Action Man presents new Action Force minifigures. I hate that child. <laughs> <laughs> now here's the thing, I, I get a kick every time I see that advert, but that really is genuinely a true representation of toy retail in the 80s. A dark, dingy shop, uh, very dusty, a guy in like an overcoat. A very and, questionable man in yeah. an overcoat. <laughs> And, and I was going to say, if you want to relive that experience, come to all the cool stuff. But uh, well, not now. now I won't say that. But, but, this, but this slide shows you the, uh, the lineup of that launch introduction range. So uh, very similar. If, 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 you, if you kind of squint and imagine that they could be like the 12 inch sort of uh, G.I. Joe characters dressed up. They're all kind of like uh, it's a disparate representation. Nothing's kind of like matched together, and across all different eight time zones as well. So you've got uh, characters that represent from World War II, for example, and then kind of into that near future. Um, after that launch, it was incredibly successful, and it came. It, it really uh, penetrated quite deeply into the boys' toy retail uh, in the UK, becoming the second best-selling toy 
after Star Wars, which for a launch product is absolutely phenomenal and actually over, overtook its, its heritage brand of Action Man. But after 82, um, the, there was a change in the marketing team and a decision was made like, well, we've kind of got all these characters um, which kind of like represent the, the Action Man side of things, but we, we've already got that play ethos in Action Man. We kind of need to create something that makes a little bit more sense in a smaller scale. So we kind of need to create a, a storyline, a mythos, so to speak. Uh, and it was around this time that they took a look at what they actually produced and try and work out a way of maximizing all of the things that they designed and paid for in terms of tooling to like make these products and see if they can change around the combination, change paint work and things like that and actually create a whole new toy line using the existing parts. Uh, and that is really fundamentally what we're here today. Um, the G.I. Joe Collectors Club over the last few years have done products that represent uh, Z-Force. We've got a quarrel in here, I've seen already just in the middle there. Um, uh, you've had uh, blades and tripwire, uh, sorry, not tripwire, Hulk and blades, uh, and you've had bombardier, hey. the red shadows. Um, but that is the you know to make sense of if you've ever thought of what all these guys are, what these what these teams are. This is what pretty much the fundamental things of what we're here today. So to give you a glimpse of some of these things, for those who've never seen this before, which I have used in the previous presentations, we just seen what that launch advert was like. And very quickly, within like the space of about 18 months, they moved very quickly to much more, for me anyway, interesting kind of advertising. Gentlemen, the world is in terrible peril from this man, Baron Ironblood, an evil genius who is determined to rule the world. These are the creatures he has created to help him. Now you must create your own action force dedicated to the Baron's downfall. Captain Campbell, you will take command of Z-Force, land-based attack troops. Captain Buckingham, the SAS, crack commando squad. Captain McLaren, Q-Force, Subaquatics, and Captain Connors, Space Force. Expect the unexpected. Where will the Baron strike next? Action Force toys, the battle has just begun. So very, very different to that first advert that we've seen. And really, if I can get it to work. Oh. Ah, there we go. So, um, through that advert, they were actually naming different teams. So we had like uh, the Z-Force, the SAS, Q-Force, and Space Force. And they were pretty much led by four individuals, like team captains. Um, and they really kind of became like the linchpin of what they then did for the next two years. Um, so if we, what we're going to do is kind of like give you, we've, we've kind of seen in previous presentations some of those toys, and we, we're still going to touch on that, but we kind of can give you a, a, a sort of bigger feeling for who these guys were, um, and give you like a, a little bit more of an understanding of like, you know, what exactly was the purpose of SAS, what exactly was the purpose of Z-Force and things like that. So what we've prepared is like looking at each team individually and give you like an insight and an understanding. Um, and then where we're here like all over the weekend, if you, if you want to understand or, or know a bit more, you know, ask away. We, we don't live here, we come a long way to like do it. But then also at the same time, feed that interest back to the club as well. Because if they know that you're interested in, in this sort of stuff, then, then they'll reciprocate and hopefully like, you know, provide you with more information on it. Welcome. Accessing the Special Action Force personnel records. Z-Force Heavy Brigade. Division Command Captain Grant Campbell. Code name Skip. Key Z-Force personnel. Field Combat Medic. Code name Dog. Communications. Code name Breaker. Communications Engineer. Code name Jammer. Vehicle Speciality Command Center. Heavy armor, code name Steamer, vehicle speciality, battle tank. Engineering, code name Tracker. Ground transportation, code name Wheels, vehicle speciality, Jeep. Mechanic, code name Gaucha, vehicle speciality, command center. Commando, code name Quora, vehicle speciality, rapid fire motorcycle. 
Minor Warfare Phoning Scout. I think the battery of this is going. Oh, there we go. So, there's a picture of the full lineup, and where we just had that computer thing talking, we tried to get that to do the whole presentation, and it was much more interesting than ourselves, but wasn't having any of it. Um, but for, for those who've never seen this stuff before, you may have recognized GI Joe products that are mixed in there uh, as well. And what happened was, at the same time that Palatoy was developing the act, uh, Action Force range, uh, Hasbro were developing the real American hero. Now the story goes, uh, neither party was aware of what they were doing. And uh, uh, to kind of put it into kind of context, Palatoy wasn't worked very closely with Hasbro, but was owned by General Mills. So like the, 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 the serials guys, they owned a portfolio of toy companies, which included Kenner. Uh, so Palatoy and Kenner were sister companies, but working with Kenner's biggest rival in the, former Hasbro. So we kind of work an awkward relationship at times. Um, but when both sides sat down and say, hey, we've got this military line product, you know, would you be interested? The other one's like, hey, we got this military line product, would you be interested in that? Um, so rather than distribute Real American here in the UK, uh, an agreement was met that uh, certain products could be used, recolored and retooled slightly uh, to then expand uh, the line into like what we see here with Z Force, but it also meant that Palatoy, in terms of the uh, costly product development, could all of a sudden expand their toy range uh, without actually necessarily like committing to like more costs or risk and things like that. So having a look through to help support this, uh, we had a weekly comic. Um, and IPC Media and Marvel Comics both pitched for uh, the uh, licensing rights to do a weekly comic. IPC Media won, um, and they would do a weekly serial uh, that would kind of give character like to all of these guys and, and like uh, uh, give you uh, allow you to identify. But however, unlike the, the Larry Hammer comics where they were monthly and you would have like 25 odd pages of a story at a time. These were like four to five pages every week. So similar to your club magazine comic, it's quite difficult. The, the, the shorter the space, the harder it is to actually write for, to kind of get a beginning and the end each week and then make a, a, a bigger story overall. Um, so it's very difficult to really kind of get the character development. But Z Force were like the main infantry. They were the biggest unit within Action Force, and they were pretty much the, the main army guys who had all the artillery and things like that. So if we look at some of these comic covers, and we'll, we'll get to it, you can see that the stories that they had, they were always working together as, as a large team, uh, quite often in the desert, which is interesting because they're all in green camo and things like that. Um, but they were the kind of missions that they were always normally facing were um, uh, sort of like uprisings, um, you know, particularly from like the um, not necessarily Red Shadows, but like other sort of like uh, military factions as well. So we had Steeler there, Skip and Wheels. So Skip was, uh, as, as we had on the video there, he was like the head of the team. So he was uh, 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 described as a millionaire playboy who got bored with life and joined the army and became the head unit of a, of a creep, uh, crack commando squad. So, you know, true, true life things. Um, but Skip would kind of always be uh, normally partnered with um, a, a lot of characters throughout the stories. He was very, he normally had like the origin stories, but you know, within the Z Force stories, they were normally together as like teams. Uh, here we see Quarrel, so Quarrel was the repaint of Scarlet. Um, and is, is a character that we've had now as a, a G.I. Joe Collectors Club uh, figure subscription service figure. But this slide is quite interesting, and this is a real main difference between the UK comics versus, say, like the uh, American ones. Because at this period of time, uh, a lot of the working force within the UK were very much directly affected by the Second World War. Um, they were either people who were still employed 
served their country during the, that period of time, or the people that were working, their direct descendants, uh, were also you know, from that conflict as well. And it's something that never kind of really went away. Um, so, and this was reflected all the time. So like I said, Action Man never, uh, uh, sorry, the 12 inch GI Joe never went away at retail for, for the UK, and we expanded it with lots of different uniforms and things like that. But war was never really a taboo subject in the UK because people were quite um, um, passionate about it. But the, the result of it is that you quite often have quite graphic content, like point blank shooting, or in this case, quarrel, literally getting nicked across the head on the front cover of the comic. You know, that's not normal, really. But. Um, <laughs> You know, and, and you would see this, but it would make, it, and on the, the, the key thing that they would always do, and we'll, we'll get to that later on in the presentation, is that they were always trying to balance out. It was like, no, nobody was invulnerable, people died. So whilst it was like some of these elements and uh, concepts were quite ridiculous in terms of fantasy or science fiction, they always tried to ground it in reality that there are winners and losers on both sides. So. Within what we've seen, you also have a couple of unique vehicles as well. So you're, you're familiar with like, you saw the battle tank there, which is like the MOBAT. But uh, if we have a look at, oh, oh there we go. So the, AT, the APC, but for us it was the ATC. This was slightly retooled. So you'll notice that the, the uh, turret is substantially different to the Hasbro version. You could open it up and put a little guy inside and had a missile rack. We also had rubber wheels. We never had actually like plastic wheels as well. Inside, uh, it was very different as well. So it was more like a command center rather than a, a figure transport. So you had like a, a medical bay and docks or a version of dock stretcher with clip in and like, uh, like uh, storage containers and things like that. And then there was like a single row of seats to allow people to sit down. If you've not seen one of these, uh, it's amazing. It, it's, it's such a cool toy. Dave Tree's fingers not included. <laughs> yeah, this is the Z Force G. So uh, again, it was another pallet toy originated design. Uh, rubber wheels. Uh, you could fit four figures, and uh, two in the front or two in the back you could stand. You also had pallet toy were very uh, always thinking ahead and had like common component parts that allowed you to swap out all the way through. Uh, so you could put the cannon or other accessories uh, at various different points. If you had the boat patrol from the SAS line, uh, you could then actually fit the boat on top of the, the jeep to create a hard top canopy. Um, so it was a repaint of, of one of the 82 vehicles, but very cool. So that was like the, the, the Z4, so that kind of gives you an idea of kind of like what they were like. The next team were really, uh, mostly identified with like the British side of things, um, being the SAS, they were like the strike teams, you know, going in behind enemy lines. But like, as you've seen on that first slide, rather than saying, you know, like for like compared with G.I. Joe being a real American hero, uh, Action Force was truly like an international, it wasn't necessarily biased from any particular country. It was like seen as like a, 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 an international elite fighting force. Special Forces. Division Command Captain Charles Richard Buckingham. Codename Eagle. Key SAS personnel. Commando Assault. Codename Quickfire. Shock Paratrooper. Codename Sparrow War. Airborne Rapid Strike. Codename Blades. Vehicle Speciality Hawk. Underwater Assault. Codename Barracuda. Seaborne Assault. Codename Stakeout, Vehicle Speciality, Boat Patrol, Waterborne Sabotage, Codename Beaver, Vehicle Speciality, Silent Attack, Air Transportation, Codename Chopper, Ground Transportation, Codename Stalker, Vehicle Speciality, Panther, Missile Assault, Codename Hunter, Vehicle Speciality, Wolverine. So there we go, very different in terms of its look compared to like the regular army guys. So I mentioned before, these were kind of like the, uh, uh, the beachhead, the, the spearhead, the first attack. 
normally you know, uh, operating behind enemy lines to like create openings to like get the main like forces in. And the stories always like uh, represented that. So uh, most of the SAS stories uh, were uh, a struggle, um, very very gritty. That they were on their own. Um, you know, running out of ammunition, improvising, you know, to try and get the mission done or, or the objective achieved. This is a this is a, a cover from one of the, the, the best comic book stories called Operation Claymore, which all happened in the Highlands um, and uh, went on for about six months in the comic. Uh, and these guys were trying to like literally they're in Scotland, Scottish Highlands, but uh, uh, there was a. An, uh, an undercover attack by the Red Shadows going on, and they were taking over, kind of like Springfield, you know, they were taking over like a, a town and that. Again, kind of like going back to what I was saying about the, the, the portrayal of violence, um, you've got uh, like the SAS guys like taking out the Red Shadows at like a point blank range. His Beaver, uh, and he was, he was featured quite a lot, uh, and also got beaten up. A heck of a lot as well, <laughs> um, and and pretty much in you know, every single story that he was in, he would literally capsize in, in the kayak and always smack his head on a rock. Um, and then by the end of the, the stories, he'd always have like bandages all over him and stuff like that. Uh, Quick fire as well was a uh, a German commando, um, and quite often, you know, playing up to the stereotypes from the like British comics and things like that, he would be you know. Uh, Saying a lot of like sort of German phrases like "ja, mein Hole" and some of things like that. Again, kind of giving you a, a bit of a glimpse of how the SAS operated. They would like literally go in and ambush to like create openings. Um, those, those are the sort of missions that they would do. And there's the, the boat patrol. So we saw um, some interesting, uh, different kind of products there. That you didn't really have in the rear American hero line, and you mentioned like Beaver with like his kayak. It was a little tiny boat that actually floated on water as well, um, and you'd stick Beaver in, and he had like his little life jacket there. You had like a little light at the front, a searchlight, and a little flag at the back, um, and there's like little different ports to like you know, store like weapons and things like that. Had little wheels so you could like use them on your carpet and that. Um, but this, this was a product that was uh, given tribute uh, recently in the uh, Q-Force kayaks that you had in, in, in a recent Joe Con uh, set. Q-Force Navy, Division Command Captain Jenny McLaren, Code Leviathan, Key Q-Force Personnel, Communications, Code Name Underwater Demolitions, Codename Shark, Vehicle Speciality, Stingray, Deep Sea Exploration, Codename Dolphin, Vehicle Speciality, Seaborne Rescue, Codename Surfer. So the Q Force was the Navy Division, so we've had like the main armoured infantry division, we've had like the rapid strike commandos, and then we've got the Q Force Navy. Now, uh, one of the smallest teams, but uh, one of the most unique in terms of its, its, its style and look, and uh, no existing real American hero products used within this line. Um, unlike the, the, the previous uh, comics uh, stories that we've like looked at here, Q Force ones were quite often solo missions, um, so it would be not necessarily as, as a team. It would quite often be just like a single character. Uh, Q Force and Space Force, which would be the next team that we'll look at, uh, never had the lion's share of the stories either. Most of the comic book stories were really centered around either Z Force or like SAS. But the main guy was uh, uh, a chap called Jamie McLaren uh, from Scotland. And he was a deep sea diver, uh, which was an odd choice for a leader because you can't really imagine this guy would be really uh, that fast underwater with all this gear on or anything like that. So he then would have uh, the jump packs 
that you had uh, from the Real American Hero Alliance. It was like given that extra propulsion when needed. <laughs> so here you can see him. Uh, we never had any kind of like red shadows frogmen up to a certain point. They 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 did later on. So. Uh, the, the artists would come up with their own interpretations to meet different things. So in this case, you have like underwater red shadow frogmen, uh, just as you would have red shadow astronauts and things like that. Uh, we saw in, in one of those slides uh, uh, the sea line, and uh, again from the GI Joe Collectors Club, from um, uh, one of the Joe Club, we had like Lieutenant Dolphin. Um, Dolphin uh, was the pilot of uh, the sea line, which is my favorite vehicle of all time. You've never mentioned that, Dave. I know. So the Sea Line was an amazing product. It was a two cockpit submarine uh, recovery vehicle. So you had like these snap opening and closing snap jaws which were operated from the back and torpedoes come up. Within the uh, cockpit, you had like uh, 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 like ports to like put on gas uh, oxygen masks. So you could put any figure in there, even if they weren't necessarily like a frogman. You had two detachable submarines that allowed them to like clip on there, and again put like the uh, uh, scuba masks on that like clipped in the back, and then all around the vehicle, again where I mentioned earlier, you had like these uh, common component parts that allowed you to like customize the vehicle as you saw fit. Uh, so you had like the gun, you could like swap them around on the main vehicle, or you could actually put them on the little detachable uh, submersibles, or a scanner, or a searchlight, or an aerial. Um, interestingly, on the uh, in the centre there, it's kind of just glitched at the moment there. Um, but you can see like the little blue area. Um, you've got a hatch which is actually taken from the Star Wars Scout Walker. So unknown to uh, General Mills and Kenner, and unknown to Hasbro. Um, Palatoy have been a little bit cheeky um, in, in terms of like minimizing costs and taking things from other toy lines that they really should, probably shouldn't have done and sticking them into like action force toys. So rather than you know do this whole new, new hatch, they, they just took the Scout Walker hatch from which was a Kenner product and stuck it on their own thing, which was then partnered up quite often with um, Hasbro parts. Ah, this is another one, uh, which is the swordfish. So it was, a, it was kind of like the, the, the mobile base unit. And as you go around, uh, it floated on water, had like a, a rubber ring, you had like the radar. And then you might recognize little parts from G.I. Joe there. Uh, you've got the mobile missile system, which was molded into the back. And it would have a torpedo on the side, but in this case, it was like broken. Um, so the Q, Q Force guys were like the Navy, um, and, and like I said, in a lot of the stories, um, you, uh, they were like solo missions, but uh, very integral as well. Occasionally they'd be like partnered up with like um, uh, in the storyline again to like transport the troops to like you know uh, for, for an invasion and things like that. But for the last team, uh, this is as, as fantastical as those elements were. They're still kind of grounded in with the reality of like a, a, a modern day military force, but the next team is actually like the Space Force, which kind of like pushed it out there a little bit. Space Force Division. Division Command Captain Chuck Collins, codenamed Sky Raider. Key Space Force personnel. Space astrogation, codenamed objects, vehicle speciality, cosmic cruiser. Combat helipilot, codename Hawkwind, vehicle speciality, satellite defense. Astral combat pilot, codename Moondancer, vehicle speciality, triad fighter. Engineering, codename Kiwi, zero G weaponry. So there we go. Space Force was, in terms of like the, the, the storyline, was the smallest team of them all. Effectively, because they were like operating in outer space, 
Um, they were just literally like the key uh, specialist astronauts. You know, it's not everyone can become a spaceman. So it was always very much like narrowed down and, 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 and focused. And again, no uh, real American hero products brought into that line. Although we'll see in a minute that there were elements like you know uh, included within the, the toys. The stories out of all of the, the different teams, Space Force had the least stories, um, and uh, it was normally uh, they had like a, an orbital defense platform where effectively they were monitoring the movements of like the enemy, so like red shadows. Uh, so they quite often get like invaded. Occasionally you'd have a mission to the moon, um, and then find that there's a huge red shadow based on the moon. Um, but uh, very, very different in terms of stories. The Triad Fighter was like the last vehicle that they brought out for uh, um, Space Force, which was quite a cool uh, uh, toy. You, it was a three cockpit uh, fighter that the front two pods would like detach and become individual shuttles themselves. And then the wings of like the central fighter would snap back on itself to become a, a fighter jet. But looking at some of the other vehicles, this is the uh, satellite defense, which is actually a remold of like the snowmobile from like '82 with extra missiles and also uh, the vamp cannon molded in, and also the instrumentation from the back of the vamp as well. But that wasn't the only thing that they included. You've also got the Millennium Falcon radar dish, <laughs> which again is another example of like where they're trying to like keep it low key and like try and use parts in in there to like minimise costs. I love the amount of cover on that vehicle. Exactly, the Cosmic Cruiser <laughs> uh, again was a, a retool of an earlier vehicle, like added parts. So it was a, a two-person uh, space cruiser. You could fit them in there. Uh, it had like landing skids that would raise and close and like a, a chin gun. But then you had the uh, rapid fire motorcycle cannons on the side there molded in and also retool of the snow speeder engines on the reverse. So we've looked at the guys from the action force side of things. Um, and whilst as cool as that all is, the bad guys are always cooler. Um, in 2010, uh, the G.I. Joe Collectors Club did uh, Vacation in the Shadows, uh, which was an introduction to uh, a new enemy faction. Now, the Red Shadows were the historic enemies of Action Force. And uh, recently, in the last sort of two years, you had Larry Hammer include like, these characters within like, his uh, version of like, the real American hero comic, and they, they, they're in the current storyline now. So the Red Shadows, they were like a mysterious movement. You know, not really much was... Uh, uh, ever really discussed or, or, or you know their their origins? You know they were just like these fanatical soldiers that kind of had a slightly German look to them, uh, and also slightly red look to them from the point of view that we're in the middle of the you know to come towards the end of the Cold War as well. The Red Shadow Movement, Organization Command Baron Ironblood, Key Red Shadows personnel. Combat Control, codename Black Major. Laser Dynamics, codename Red Laser. Vehicle Speciality, Laser Exterminator. High Speed Armored Combat, codename Red Vulture. Vehicle Speciality, Shadow Trap. Armored Assault, codename Red Jackal. Vehicle Speciality, Hyena. Atmospheric to Air Assault. Codename Red Wolf. Vehicle Speciality Robostar. Infantry. Codename Red Shadow. Underwater Assault. Codename Kraken. Drone Assault. Codename Mutal. Experimental Cyborg. Codename Skeleton. Now that's pretty normal, yeah? <laughs> Um, so, the Red Shadows uh, really took it somewhere, um, and within there you had like uh, faceless fanatical soldiers, you had uh, giant sea lizards, uh, you had uh, a couple of different robots, and a giant flying red skull. 
Um, but the Red Shadows were actually like the most fun out of all the teams uh, and you know, very, very collectible today. Uh, you'll notice that within, the, within that like, bio, uh, only one character really had like a, a, a country of origin, which was Red Jackal. Uh, that was Latvia. Um, and that was pretty much because both Red Jackal and uh, the Black Major were former Action Force uh, members. Uh, Red Jackal was a member of like the Z Force who uh, got critically injured and was in, in a series of unfortunate circumstances left for dead. Um, but then Baron Ironbar took him in and rebuilt him as like a, a, a robot again, um, as Red Jackal. Um, so a lot of the stories, again, this is actually one of my favorite covers of all time, uh, the Baroness. So uh, after uh, 1984, the introduction of Cobra uh, came into uh, a lot of the uh, storylines. And for us, the uh, Cobra, uh, whilst the character was similar, uh, their origins were very different to the real American hero. And Baron Ironblood, who was like the head of the Red Shadows, effectively forsaked his movement um, and sent them all on suicide missions uh, to then become Cobra Commander. So he reinvented himself and a, a whole new terrorist organization. But a lot of the Red Shadows survived. And so they not only were fighting for their own movement, but they were also fighting against Cobra because they, they, they wanted to kill their former commander. The Kraken, uh, giant sea lizard, uh, was discovered in the North Pole. Um, and again, it was a great story uh, where Baron Ironblood and the Black Major got cut off uh, in the North Pole and uh, 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 ended, ended up in a, in a cavern where they found this like uh, lizard uh, entombed in ice. So they killed all the Red Shadows because nobody, nobody can know about this. Um, and then revisited at a later time to like uh, you know, clone and make their own underwater troopers. Coming back to like the uh, quite graphic content of like the, the magazine, uh, you can see uh, one of the Kraken here physically drowning an SAS soldier. You know, I mean that's a give you nightmares as a kid. Uh, you had like the laser exterminator and uh, red laser, who was like uh, effectively their technology specialist, and uh, red vulture and the shadow tracks, which again in in the Larry Hammer comic, you've just recently seen the, the Shadow Track inclusion. Um, again, Larry included like Muton, which is an indestructible robot, um, but as a toy, it's completely lame. Uh, and, and it's quite often ridiculed beyond belief, even more than a spe uh, green lizard. Uh, but as we mentioned there, it, this is the moment that the Black Major and Red Laser realize that Baron Ironblood is that actually, sorry, that Cobra Commander is actually Baron Ironblood, their former commander. Um, but you would see uh, stories still including uh, Red Jackal actually sought out Baron Ironblood, uh, was defeated, sorry, Cobra Commander, defeated by Cobra Commander and then reinvented as Destro. The only other person to complete the, the changeover to the new movement was Red Wolf, uh, and became like the Roboscope pilot. But there was quite often dealings between the two in terms of um, trying to um, you know, get back at their former commander. So, as I said within the comics, oh, we got the, 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 the shadow track just having a look around. So again, this is a two vehicle, uh, two person vehicle, and you can like move the cannons around and plug them into the various different points, aerials and things like that. And whilst it was a red shadow driver, the, the, the distinguishing <coughs> difference between Red Vulture and a normal Red Shadow is that Red Vulture effectively had black gloves. So, uh, uh, not much going on there. You had like a, a tow hook to like uh, carry the uh, laser exterminator and side missiles. The Robo Skull is effectively a crazy looking TIE fighter. Uh, a, a giant skull with two wings, uh, machine guns coming out of his uh, uh, eyes and uh, uh, by the size of his jaw. The wings rotated so you could have vertical takeoff and you had various cannons on the sides of the wings. Uh, the wings themselves were made to look like a, a imagery from like Gothic Cathedral. You had a front cockpit and you had a gunner's cockpit in the rear where you could like stick Red, Red Wolf or any other uh, character. 
Then underneath you had a, uh, uh, a passenger compartment or, or perhaps for like captives. But what we mentioned about the comics, they were always very keen to like balance it out and give you an idea of like you know good versus evil. So if you were in Q Force uh, within the comic, one person got killed in action. That's not bad. Within Space Force, over the period of two years, eight people got killed in action. It's getting a little higher. For the SAS, <laughs> it suddenly jumped to 72. <laughs> And if you're in Z Force, it got to 96 in the space of two years. So the moral of this is join Q Force, <laughs> your rate for survival is much higher. So we looked at like all of those teams there and also the bad guys, but like uh, in 84, the uh, design department got the plug pulled on them by General Mills, and the decision was then to like just bring across like literally the real American hero products. Um, but that wasn't to say that that was the end of the story. A lot of stuff was being developed there by uh, Palatal to like carry it on. As far as they were concerned, they were like, you know, this, this, this line was doing incredibly well. It was like number two after Star Wars. Um, so they were working on lots of different things. So as a result, there was a lot of unproduced concepts that never saw the light of day. So there we go, Special Weapons Force. Um, we've seen one of those characters uh, last year for the figure subscription service, Bombardier. Uh, and it was uh, from, from some people who had a little bit of confusion as who, who was this guy. Well, he never actually made it to the toy line. It was quite a, a, a mystery for a couple of years as to you know, who this was. But that was like looking at an unproduced team um, that just looked like they were all within the kind of weapons development side of things, so uh, top secret. But the other sorts of things that you saw uh, being developed were the Z Force ATV, which was uh, very much like a Rough Riders kind of buggy. Uh, and uh, the, the, the idea behind this was that it could be uh, literally either a personnel carrier, so you see at the rear here, you've got two doors that would transport like wounded people. Um, or it could be for transporting like the pack rats. Uh, you know, it was never you know, it was like looking at what, what could we do with this sort of thing. Uh, Z Force also, uh, another area of development was a portable basis, so modular bases, uh, effectively uh, centered around uh, a missile station, an anti aircraft station, and like a radar post. Uh, and there was a couple of different things that they're exploring there, so maybe like, you know, they clip together on like a tripod or raised up, or could even be like in a cube formation, you know, for like containers for ease of transport, but then you open them up and, you know, clip them together. The SAS, uh, you'll start seeing influences of what was going on around that time. Um, kind of looks a little bit like the 18. Uh, or it looks a lot like the 18. And considering like the SAS and you know the kind of things that we're doing, this isn't exactly very covert. Um, but the idea behind this was uh, this was like a mobile operations base that would like open up and uh, become like a missile or, or gunner station. Uh, this was mocked up uh, just to like prove the concept, uh, and as you can see there, it kind of opens up. You can see like different like missiles from like uh, the hovercraft and, and um, uh, the Wolverine there. Uh, Q Force, we're going to be developing a lot more uh, sort of subaquatic vehicles. Uh, that top right one there is, is like an early concept for like the sea line. Uh, but also kind of underwater exploration and also like diving bells as well, which were pretty cool. Space Force had like a, an exocraft, which was very much influenced by uh, NASA's spacewalk with uh, the, the space shuttle at the time. So the idea was that uh, you had like an exosuit that 
would then sit forward so you could fly it as a craft and then it would open up and then you had like a, a, a grabber arm that uh, you could like fix satellites with or have like missiles and shoot shoot things out of the sky. There's a rear view of it, fixing the satellite. Uh, the Red Shadows, we're going to boost their forces with Cyclops. <laughs> now, I don't think it was based on He-Man. <laughs> But I, it is. Uh, so the Cyclops was going to be uh, a hand-to-hand -hand combat gladiator, which um, is interesting, but then again, next to a giant green lizard, uh, a, a skeleton cyborg, and uh, a few other sort of like robots, you know, why not? But the Red Shadows had a lot of things being developed as well, so more attack craft, and these were really kind of like pushing it out there. So more concepts. They're kind of like a flying saucer, but with huge bombs or ray guns and things like that. You know, maybe the tie, tie fighter influence and things like that. But each time we do one of these presentations, we want to give you something new. We want to give you something special. So we're extremely grateful uh, for one of the lead designers on the line, Robert Brecken. As uh, and this, this is genuinely exclusive, guys. He's uh, allowed us to show you a couple of unproduced concepts that he's never really shared with anybody else. So this is a real treat. Robert uh, was the lead designer for Action Force, but is a genuine, true legend for G.I. Joe as a whole. He is the man who gave you your Kung Fu grip. Um, that was a British invention for the Action Man line and sculpted on his own hand. Um, and he's, he's more known for his innovations within uh, uh, Action Man and, and 12 inch G.I. Joe more than um, the 3 and 3 quarter inch, but he was the lead designer on this. So Bob is sharing with you for the first time, we're extremely grateful uh, to show for the first time the female space pilot. Uh, they were going to do a five point articulated um, uh, a female character, which was the first time that we, they were doing this. They had quarrel, but that was a reuse of like an, a real American hero product. Uh, so that was very cool. You can see to the right uh, an early uh, version of the space engineer. <coughs> but she was going to be flying potentially uh, the cosmic troop transport. Uh, so very Space 1999 influence. Uh, this was like a, a, a troop transport for the space guys, uh, where each of the pods, so uh, like, like the Imperial troop transport, if you're familiar with that from the Star Wars, like these pods would open up and like the, the guys could deploy out. Um, now the big one, which I'm really really super excited about, is and Brian's at the front, so that's good news here. Oh, it's not Suspenseful. <laughs> the Red Shadows Officer. So, uh, very, if you're familiar with Crow, uh, Hellboy, kind of looks a little Cronin-like. Um, now, the idea behind this was uh, to kind of have middle management for the, uh, for the infantry. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, the one that the, 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 the everybody could shout at, really, and, and, and carry the can. And, rest of it but uh, the Red Shadows officer was intended this this is not necessarily how it was uh, destined to, to become this is like the early concept to like prove the, the, the need for, for this character um, so it, it's a kit bash and all the modeling as of all these other previous ones we've been looking at um, none of these actually got tooled up but very cool concepts and give you a glimpse in terms of where they were like taking the line so if you want to know more about this, if you've enjoyed this panel, uh, uh, Chris and I uh, are very much intrinsically linked with a show in the UK called Roll Out Roll Call, which is uh, a, a show about uh, Transformers, Action Force and G.I. Joe that's held in the UK. We have the Full Force Pod Podcast, uh, which is part of the What's On Joe Mind family. Uh, there's an amazing site called BloodForTheBaron.com, which is a great archive of uh, uh, pictorial references, and they kindly allowed us to use a lot of the images for, for this presentation, and also Yojo.com uh, as well. You might not have heard of that. <laughs> <laughs> but if you want to see more of this, if you enjoyed this uh, and you want to see more, you all, each of you has a JoeCon feedback form, so put that in the feedback. You know, Join the G.I. Joe Collectors Club forums say it on there. 
uh, make requests for the figure subscription service. You know, we've been really lucky and fortunate that each year so far we've had like a British character. You know, that the current one, which we haven't received yet, is Big Ben, but Big Ben is now considered as part of the, the special action group. So if you really enjoyed all of these things, let the club know. None of this will happen unless these guys know. So you really got to keep, you know, please uh, keep bashing on at them and say, um, we want more of this stuff. Uh, because they're probably tired of hearing it from like Chris and myself. So thank you very much. <laughs> and that concludes.